Welcome to another edition of Behind the Mask with Rich Glazer. I am happy to have Chris Losey on today to speak with us. Chris, how are you? Thanks for coming on. Good to be here. Thanks, John. Doing well. How about you? Doing well. Um, I wanted to lay the groundwork a little bit for, you know, our relationship, your relationship with the organization um, over the years of how we know each other. Um, I met you at a time where I probably thought I was a tremendously talented and knowledgeable umpire. Um, I had 22 or 23 years old, and I probably wasn't qualified at that time to work a 12 or 13-year-old game. Uh, I get a lot of questions all the time. It's a common question for a lot of umpires who do varsity baseball or college baseball. Who taught you how to umpire? Who uh, influenced you the most? And while we disagree on a variety of topics all the time, I always mention your name. Um, I remember just working a specific men's league game with you where you broke me down on the bases and things like that. So, um, you know, I think you could provide a lot of valuable information to umpires out there. You certainly helped me. Um, and you have a unique perspective on the umpiring uh, industry as it stands Thank right you. now. So thanks for all your help. And uh, hopefully that gives My everybody pleasure. a little base level Thank of you. understanding on where we stand. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, let me get right to my first question. I'm curious of your opinion on the status of amateur umpiring in general. Not TSEUA, not high school, not, nothing specific. Right. In the region, in the country, where are we, are we getting better? Are we getting worse? What do you see? Well, uh, in my experience, uh, to answer the, the second question first, I think we're getting worse. Um, the problem is I, I identify umpire groups in three categories. You've got the good, you got the okay, and you got the bad. And unfortunately, the bad and the okay are growing and the good are shrinking. And then you're left with a dilemma, and you ought to know as an assigner better than anybody that you can only get a good one because coaches want a good one in this particular game, and that group is definitely shrinking. So it's unfortunate. Um, back when I started uh, 30 years ago, it was a lot different then. Um, you didn't even get games your first year, maybe your first couple of years, especially at the high school level. Um, nowadays, it's a part-time job for people, and that's unfortunate. So it, it's going in a direction that's, that's not a good direction for, uh, for umpires. Do you, do you have any particular reasons that you're aware of that it's getting worse? Because I'm not so sure you're wrong, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm not sure where I stand on it, but why do you think that we're getting worse uh, as a group? I think that the new blood, uh, unfortunately, treats this as a second job. Uh, they only treat it like they're going to uh, punch a time clock and get a paycheck and, and not care about improving. Some of us go overboard that we want to do a good job. I mean, I'm definitely one of them, and I'm, I'm guilty of charge. Um, but not not enough of those guys have that mindset. I mean, I see it at the clinics all the time, with all due respect. Constantly I see it at the clinics. There are guys there that just don't have it, and they don't understand that what it takes. It's not a part-time job. It's not, oh, I think I'll do this. You just don't go into it now. Sounds like a self-awareness issue. I think a lot of umpires struggle with self-awareness, self-evaluation. You know, their opinion of themselves probably uh, varies greatly from if you or I see them at a clinic. And uh, that reality check is, is, is usually not well taken. I, I would agree with that. Um, the, the thing is, the reality check for us, though, being at the level that we're at, John, uh, every game is video. And uh, last year I had the... Uh, uh, pleasant experience of having a uh, false challenge by instant replay. So it, it's, it's definitely one of those, um, those reality checks. And uh, as you mentioned, um, but again, it, it's gotten to the point now where um, you can't tell anybody any. Yeah. Trust. I get it. I get it. Go ahead, Rich. Of course, uh, you know, we know that you uh, worked for a while in the minor leagues. How long did you actually work there and under what circumstances? Well, in full disclosure, uh, it started as a replacement umpire uh, in 2006. As a collegiate umpire in this area, the minor league guys walked out before the start of the season. And our assigner at the time 
uh, became the assigner for all three leagues, the International League, the Eastern League, and the Carolina League. So he basically uh, strongly suggested that we work these games, and uh, which we did. Uh, I shouldn't say he did it. I said maybe others, but I, I actually wanted to do it. Uh, if I do recall, it's been 14 years, but I do recall that there was, they asked, they weren't going to force anybody to do them. So, but um, I wanted to do it. And I opened the season on the plate in Harrisburg in a double A game, which I still have that video. Um, Is that with but Chris in any Cook? event, yeah. yeah but in any event, uh, that strike was supposed to last two or three days. And I think with us doing the games, that lasted until right after Memorial Day wow. of uh, 2006. Then the following year, I worked in the Can-Am League. Now, this is where I was a regular umpire, not as a strike replacement guy. The Can-Am League is independent league, so there's no affiliation to a major league team. It's just a bunch of guys that are trying to, to catch on somewhere, guys that were in the, in the big leagues or in, in organized ball. And I did that for a couple of years. Um, then I was a fill-in in the Atlantic League, and I did some Atlantic League baseball. And um, so I'd say all told, I have about – maybe eight years experience at that level. Chris, when you were working in the minor leagues, <clears throat> was there any blowback from the umpires whom you were replacing temporarily? Yes. yes. Or, tell, tell me about it. Well, uh, one of the things, uh, there was a list of uh, umpires that we were called scabs, which is fine with me. And uh, that list was published throughout the country. So everybody knew what I did. And again, I didn't care. And we had local guys that were there that were on strike that were coming to our games, Trenton, uh, Bowie, Scranton. Now, Scranton was an interesting story because that's AAA. And uh, there was a, some kind of a, a deal, I, I would assume, that you couldn't go to AAA unless somebody from minor league baseball looked at you. And I recall in my situation, I had a Mother's Day game, it was the finale of a, of a three-game series in Trenton. And um, after the game, I was asked to meet uh, Justin Clem in a conference room. Now, Justin Clem, at the time, was the head of um, PBUC, which is Professional Baseball Umpire Corporation, which is down in Florida, which is where all the young guys come from. So I said, geez, what did I do now? And he called me in, and he said, uh, you're going to go to Scranton this weekend. Or he asked me where I was going first this weekend. I think I said, um, I think I'm coming either here again or I'm going to uh, Harrisburg. He said, no, you're going to go to Scranton. So that made me feel good that I was good enough to pass that little test. So that, that's how that works. Uh, they just wanted to make sure that guys that were one step away from Major League Baseball on the field uh, could handle themselves. Would you have wanted to go up to Major League if the op opportunity presented? So? God, yeah. I, Rich, you know me as well as anybody. I would love to. I wouldn't care how I got there to do a game. Uh, you know, I know that I'm on a list with other guys that are local, that if the Phillies need guys, and they use that list. And uh, I think that was five or six years ago, maybe more. Uh, no, it was, maybe it was 11 years ago. John McGardle, uh, Frank Sylvester, and Scott Graham worked first, second, and third in the Phillies-Cubs game because the Joe West crew was stuck in traffic in Baltimore. So the Phillies have numbers of umpires local. So what I hope that – thanks, Luca. So what I hope that someday that uh, somebody's crew gets stuck in traffic and I get a phone call, absolutely. I wouldn't care how I got there. With, with, your, uh, with your experience at all levels of baseball from top to bottom, I think it's – especially for somebody who still will, you know, work lower-level games for me in particular, which I appreciate. You know, you'll still get out there and work travel baseball – perfect game, uh, men's league baseball Sunday mornings, you know, with a variety of different skill levels and then having experience up through high school, college, and professional baseball. What, what, do you, what is your advice to umpires in our organization or around the country who are working perfect game type of events or varsity high school baseball who want to get into college baseball? Well, well it's a two-part question. The first thing is the advice for the young guys is um, – Take in as much as you can. Uh, you don't have to agree with everything. Like I mean, John said at the top of the show here that he and I don't agree. We don't agree on a lot of things. But um, 
you know, I've, I've met him in the middle more than he's met me in the middle. I'll, I will say Probably that. True. But um, having said that, you don't have to agree with what people are telling you. There are guys that are out there that just want to tell you what to do because they want to show that they're superior to you. You have to make a decision as a young umpire. Is that person that's giving you advice somebody that you want to listen to? And is that advice something that you believe in? So I get those phone calls a lot from guys and said, hey, Chris, this umpire told me to do A when you told me to do B. And I said, okay. I said, what do you think is the better one? And he said, oh, well, you taught me. I said, well, fine. So, you know, it's not appropriate to tell the guy, you know, I'm not going to do this or don't tell me what to do as a young guy. Take everything in and, and, and attach to somebody that you trust. And just keep those lines of communication open and say, hey, I worked with a guy today, his name is Rich, and what he told me was totally contradictory to what you told me. What do I do? You know, always have somebody, I had somebody, always have somebody that you can rely on and that you can trust. And I will get into that later on, but trust is a big issue, and unfortunately it's a, it's a big pitfall right now at, at the higher level. You know what I think, uh, I think you'll agree with me here, because I think it's a rarity to have somebody that you can trust entirely with telling you everything about what you need to know. And if you have somebody like that, you're very lucky. But otherwise, I think people need to, or umpires need to develop an ability to distinguish between good information and bad information. Right. The same person can provide you with some good information and some bad. I think a skill to getting better is being able to decipher, take the good, discard the bad. How do, how do we do that? Uh, you need to go to your mentor. You need to go to somebody that's going to point you in that direction and say, hey, I kind of like what this guy did. What do you think? Or I kind of like what this guy said. Another thing, the first clinic I ever taught was uh, 2006 <clears throat> in Florida. And I'll never forget this because somebody asked me, what's your style? And I said, my style is a combination of so many other umpires that I've watched on television. You see something you like and you put it into your game. Steal it. And, and that becomes you. You see whatever you like, you put it into your game. And my first, the guy I liked first was Greg Bonin, right? And spelled B-O-N-I-N. And he was a scissor guy. That's how I got to get into the scissor. And I liked his strike mechanics. And that was my, that was pretty much my strike mechanic for the first 15 years of my career. Fascinating. Go ahead, Rich. Uh, Chris, uh, you've been around a long time. You've seen and you've worked with umpires from all different organizations. How would you compare our TSE trained umpires versus umpires that are coming out of other groups? Well, the only barometer that I can compare it to are the umpires that are local and that are probably in competition with TSC. Now, I'm going to be biased because I'm part of that instructional staff. Uh, the guys that John brings in, uh, the tri-state elite guys uh, are, are willing to learn. And that's more than you can say about a lot of umpires in our area with other organizations. They just go to a cadet class. They don't learn much. And then they get just jumped onto the field. And they're on the field because those groups have those contracts. But our group, I think, um, the ability to improve is better in our group than any other group I've been in at this level. Yeah, good. Full disclosure, uh, you know, for anybody watching, Chris is on our training staff. He's been with us. He works for us. Um, you know, we've been working together for a while, Chris. So yeah, you are going to be biased, but I think that is the least biased answer you can give. Our guys at yeah. clinics, I think, are 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 generally very open in yeah. comparison to to getting better in what what we have to give them. I think that's they a are. good and fair. I mean, they see guys like John Harrington you know, and Jerry Wilgus and, 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 and guys that are getting stronger and stronger resumes each year. Um, I think Jerry is a, is a very good official. And um, anytime I hear, you know, oh, Jerry, you know, he does a nice job. I mean, that puts a smile on my face because, you know, I, he was one of my guys too, that, like yourself, John. Jerry was another guy. Yep. And so – People say, are, are you jealous? And on the contrary, I'm elated. Nothing would make me prouder than to see John Galante get into an NCAA region. I don't care how he gets there. Yeah. You know, always, and that's, and always, that's another thing. Huh? Go no, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
and that's another thing, you know, unfortunately, you know, at, at the levels that, that I've gotten into, there are not a lot of un, unkind people in this industry. And, you know, and Rich can, it will tell you, in my other world, I'm a broadcaster. And being a broadcaster and being open and brain, being, I guess, uh, you know, gregarious and outspoken and all those things, it doesn't fit well in being a baseball official or on any official for that matter. And I realized that this off season with this unfortunate uh, pandemic that we're going through, that uh, what's missing is, are the games that I'm calling. I'm, I'm missing games I'm calling on television. And I'm realizing though, that what I went through, look, I'll be honest with both of you guys. The thing that has kept me out of, of being at, at a higher, higher level is, is me, is, is the attitude I brought. Um, you know, a lot of guys that, like Rich said, I should not have listened to, and I did. And, uh, you know, reputations are what they are. But then the other thing, too, is this is such a cutthroat business. I mean, you can ask me more about that if you want later, but this is totally a cutthroat business. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, yeah. On the topic of – I'm glad you brought up Jerry and guys like that, but uh, I always can, I always say Jerry is the best umpire in Cumberland County. Yeah. Yeah, I mean uh, – I mean, <laughs> He does not like that. He doesn't like when I say it because there's about well, there, he, don't forget County. Rudy Matheson. He's in Cumberland County too, oh, right? <laughs> let's move on. Yeah. Um, this is sort of open ended, and I, if you don't understand the, the the point of the question, I can try to get into it. But sure. we had a couple of questions come in last week to me about yeah. the, number one, the importance of which umpiring organization you basically hook yourself in with and how, how, a, how will that affect where you go or how will that affect your future as an umpire? Can you talk on those two topics or do you, do you want me to expand on that a little more? No, I, I think I got it. Uh, the first question is what group do you want to pick? Like you how gotta you pick look, it. Yeah. The group and how you pick it. Right. The one you're going to pick. Right. Uh, what, what group you're going to join. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why you're going to join that particular group. All right. Well, the answer that I would give you is look at that group, look at the guys that have come out of that group, see where they've gone, okay, and then see what opportunities that group has. And I'm talking about schools and opportunities where they can work games. If you're looking to join a group for, um, for high school, you have a group here that you like. If you're looking for recreational ball, summer ball, travel ball, you have this group. So... It depends on what those groups have to offer from availability as well. Not availability from an umpire's perspective, but what they have that they can give you, what games that they can give you, as well as who's in that group and see how far they've advanced and why they've advanced there. Did they advance up to where they've been because of the group that you're about to join? Now, the second part of that is basically how much of your affiliation with an organization and sort of the impact of that organization how much does that affect your career as an umpire? Basically, you join a bad group, will that hinder your advancement? You join a great group, will that enhance your ability to advance? Um, I'm going to say probably not really on both of those cases. However, to the first part, if you're in a bad group, just like that sore thumb, if you stick out that you can work, and you ought to know this, John, you can say, you know what, he's with this group, but the guy can work, I'm going to take him and put him in my group. So sometimes somebody that's in a bad group that can, that can work, that would be to their advantage because then they'll be easily noticed. Never thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Come Think ahead, about Rich. that. I mean, yeah. Um, go ahead. We're a little windy outside, but, you know, I don't want to go inside because the renovations are still going on in the house, so I apologize. We can, uh, for the record, we can state that as our first disagreement of the evening. There you go. Go ahead, Rich. All right, my question is this. <clears throat> uh, being a baseball umpire, is there a really good part-time game? Why, then, is it so difficult for us to recruit people to become umpires? <clears throat> because if you it's, – it's not a part-time gig. That's the problem. It's an avocation, all right? There's a big difference. If you look up that word, it'll be like a second part of your life. It's not – a part-time job people look at it as a part-time job they come in I mean I can recall 
getting a phone call at eight o'clock in the morning for a 12 o'clock game. And it's my partner. And he says, well, I woke up this morning with a migraine. I'm not going to work today. That's not what it is. And people go into this. John, you would know better than anybody. How many of you guys went in and just decided this wasn't for them? It's not what you think it is. You have to commit so much money, time, dedication, all those things to even get to step one before you can say that you're an umpire. It, this is not a part-time job. It doesn't have any kind of salary. You don't get sick days, and people don't understand that. It's just that's the way the trend is. Back when I started, we, it was so different. It was what so that we all were on the same page. What do you attribute the nationwide umpire? We, I always say, full disclosure, also, we're really not a, we're not really in a, in a bad spot. We have a lot of umpires, and and we have a lot of guys who come in our cadet program as new umpires. But nationwide, there is a shortage. What do you attribute that to? Well, the, the two things. I mean, number one, everybody's got a phone now, and umpires are getting harassed. Officials are getting harassed. Look, there we go. Officials are getting harassed everywhere. Who wants to put up with that anymore for whatever it is, $75, $80? Or in the case of a junior varsity game, $55 or $56. It's, a, it's just too much abuse right now. It's gotten so bad, uh, I can tell you in our high school football group, I'm a member of two of them, that uh, they're talking very strongly about scheduling Thursday night and Saturday afternoon games because they just simply don't have enough guys on Fridays. And that never happened before. You used to have lines out the door to get in these groups. Right. But it's just – it's not worth it anymore. It's not. People are getting shot. People are getting jumped, followed to their cars. The cars are key scratched. You know, that's just – that's insane. It just hasn't been that way in a long time. And I'm afraid it's it's going to get worse before it gets better. I think, unfortunately, one of the outcomes of this pandemic, though, I think we will get a uh, – I don't know how long it will last, but we, I think we will get an influx of some umpires looking – where people looking at us umpiring as a part-time job coming in to make a couple of And you have to, right. And you as the assigner and the president are going to have to weed out guys that want, want it for additional income and want it to act, wants it to really, really be an umpire. Yeah. Big difference. I spent, a, you know, I spent, I spent a lot of time um, trying to recruit umpires for our recent cadet class. Actually, it turned out that we had the biggest cadet class uh, of, of, of all time for us, <clears throat> excuse me. But I had spoken to maybe 20 people, 12 of whom were desperate, were really desperate to start. They loved the idea. A lot of them had part-time jobs. They thought this would be a good supplement. Uh, some of the people were retired. <clears throat> they thought it would be a good opportunity. They liked baseball. They thought, you know, the extra income would come in handy. When push came to shove, we wound up of the 20 or so, the list got down to three people that actually joined the cadet class. Okay. So you have to say, um, it's funny because in, in a previous life, I was a softball player in those men's leagues back in the day, and I, I was a pitcher, a very valuable commodity. The season's over, you get a phone call, hey, you want to pitch for us? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. The statement was, say yes to people in August and September and say no to them in March before the next season. Same thing applies here. You want to umpire? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. And then as soon as it comes to time, okay, you ready? I need a check for this amount. Oh, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. It's not for everybody, Rich, and I think you know that. I know John knows that. It yeah. just isn't for everybody. You know, I, I think that uh, theoretically – they were interested, and then in a follow-up conversation, you know, they began to realize, well, it's going to cost X number of dollars to come right. to the cadet class. I got to buy gear. Um, I have to, um, you know, pay dues, sign fees. You know, they don't. Re and, but I try to explain it away by saying, if you're doing games and you're getting a lot of games, the income you're making doing those games is more than going to offset your upfront expenses. You've got to make an investment. You just can't walk in, make money, and without ever putting a dime out. Well, that's I, the word. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, and, and I think uh, the reason we didn't get 
uh, a lot of those people who initially said yes and expressed high interest. And I kept telling John, this, I got all these people lined up and then all these people decided for whatever reason, it could have been the money. And they realized how much money it was going to cost up front. They decided it wasn't worth it or didn't want to do it or didn't have the money. Let's, well, I don't know if the money was the issue, why they, they changed their mind. I think it was they started to have second thoughts and they're like, what's exactly involved? I mean, John makes no bones about it when he puts out those initial emails or uh, those phone calls to people that you're going to work. You're going to, we need your dedication. We need you thinking baseball all the time. And that sometimes guys don't want that. They just don't want, well, you know, I'm going to go, I think this looks good. I'll call balls and strikes. It's not that way at all. A lot of people envision us as like a, a 30 minute or an hour and a half session to teach you how to umpire. When we put out that it's an eight week, eight weeks yeah. for an hour and a half a piece, I think that's where we lose some people. But sure. again, we're very lucky to have, we had a, almost a 20 person cadet class. Um, but let's transition a little bit. Your, I, I've heard your, uh, basically your instructional methods. And there's a lot of stuff that you teach that number one, I've stolen from you. And two, things that can easily be implemented tomorrow, if somebody heard it, that would help them. Give me something. What, what is someone who's a varsity high school umpire right now, maybe they're a JV guy, what is something or the, one of the most common problems that you can fix over this video that would help somebody if they had a game tomorrow? All right, well, one, definitely, and, and again, uh, full disclosure, I got these from guys, too. I mean, that's, that's how it works, right? So uh, I credit Bill McCallum, NCAA uh, regional advisor, uh, very, very good baseball band, excellent umpire. Uh, TPDR was the first one, and that's about how you decide where pitches are. Track, process, decide, and render, right? You, you heard me say that before. Uh, but more uh, a simpler thing would be four eyes on the baseball. Because most guys that break into baseball are going to be in a two-man game. Everybody watches the baseball. Both umpires watch the baseball. Yes, you have other responsibility. You watch touches and bags. But when you have a possible trouble ball, you're both watching the ball. What does it take to take your eyes from the ball in flight to a bag real quick and then back to a ball in flight? So four eyes on the baseball. So that, That's the simplest one I could come up with. That would lead, that would lead me to – uh, in a two-man crew, that is basically four eyes on the baseball is basically prioritizing your responsibilities as a crew because Absolutely. it would be way more important to get sure. catch, no catch, fair, foul, home run, sure. or foul, right, than if somebody missed first base. That's what you're saying. I am, and it would also eliminate what I'm sure you would love as an assigner for one of your umpires to tell a coach, that's not my call. My responsibility is to watch the touch at first base as a base umpire with nobody on. I'm sure you'd love to hear that, right? That's one way to get moved off a roster really quickly. Right. So that that would basically eliminate that. So, gotcha. Yeah. We're, we're going to have a, lot, a much more time to talk about some of these things, but I want to transition to right. our fan-submitted mailbag. I use the term fan loosely because some of these are pretty vicious if you've ever seen this before. Do they like me? Do they know me, first of all? That's the thing. So. Well, we put it out on YouTube that we were going to have you on, and uh, you know, through the ejection video, we ended up with a lot of uh, probably notoriety that we didn't expect. Uh, that video is up <laughs> over three hundred thousand views. Nice. Uh, so we got. A I bunch wish I was a part of that. By the way, you owe me one. I'm going to have to remake my. End. We're going to try to film it again, but I don't know if we'll ever be able to recapture the viral nature of that video. Um, but you're always welcome. Um, first question <laughs> is Sal from Buna, New Jersey. What is your biggest? What is your biggest weakness as an umpire? What about for Galante? There are plenty, I'm sure, for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sal, that's mild. In uh, thank in you, Sal, for your question. Um, first of all, as far as John is concerned, I look at myself, and I, when I look at John, that's me. Uh, 25 years ago, I was the same way. Um, so. That's why whenever – I don't know, Sal, serious about your weaknesses or not, but, you know, that's why I believe you deserve every benefit of the doubt. You're working your tail off. So be that as it may with weaknesses. My weakness – I think my biggest weakness is Chris Losey. And, Getting you very know, meta here. Sorry? Very meta, that answer. Yeah, very meta. 
I mean, it, it's the truth. I mean, you know, when you have a job interview, how many people have said that what's your biggest strength? I'd say my communication skills. What's your biggest weakness? My communication skills. Because I can communicate with such ease that other people can't. And sometimes that communication interferes or intrudes on some others. And that's why, and I said this earlier, uh, my personality did not fit to be at the higher, higher, higher level of baseball. I mean, I did some very good college baseball last year, and um, I worked with guys that just um, I would prefer not to work with. I mean, and I'm 51 years old now. God. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's unfortunate. Um, I've, I've learned, I learn lessons every day in life, but on the field, 30 years in baseball, 28 in football, 27 in basketball. And I've learned that you're only as good as your partner. And if you get a guy on a crew that is only out to get you to write in an evaluation so that they can get more games and they can stick it to you, that's not going to help anybody. Nobody. And unfortunately, I opened the door for that. I gave people ammunition to shoot. So that's my biggest weakness, Sal. Don't let anybody, don't give anybody ammunition to shoot. You. What was, did you give my uh, weakness or was my weakness that I'm similar to you? No. Um, well, I don't know. I, I really think they mean the, for me, I think they mean for me on the field, but. Oh, uh, as, an, as an umpire? I, I'm assuming. Well, you know, in my opinion, as, as I like to say all the time, you need more grass under your feet. You need to be exposed to the higher level on a regular basis, more and more and more and more and more. I don't care how you get there. Whatever it takes to get there at your level and your age, get there. So your experience, your, your lack of experience at higher level, that's your weakness. You're, you adapt easily. You may not admit to it, but when I say something to you, you change that. You know, Jerry says something to you, you do change it. You won't admit you do, but I know you do. I admitted it in the opening. What are you talking about? No, I'm talking about now. Not, oh. not, not when you're cutting your No, I, I do. I, I take it seriously. And sometimes I, I, at this point, you know, I probably have more confidence in my own knowledge. But sometimes I agree with what you say. Sometimes I don't. And then sometimes I disagree. And then I come around to agreeing later. Exactly. But you don't, but you don't recognize that to that person that you are agreeing with them later. Yeah, and then I you don't go back and say, "Remember when you said so and so? You were right." And you don't I do still, that, so I that's your weakness. Call it a disagreement. That's good. That's your weakness. Go ahead, Rich. Question two. Uh, Chris, uh, if you had to pick a dream team of umpires for a four-man crew, who would you choose, and at what positions? The question is coming from Jeff from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Well, Jeff, you're probably not going to know any of these guys, um, but these are guys that. Um, that taught me how to umpire. Uh, so let's see, positions. Uh, I'm going to give you the guys first. So I'm, I'm on this crew, right, Rich? I don't know. If you put I'm yourself asking. there. Am I on this or four other guys? No, no, we'll, we'll allow you to be the crew chief. So I'm on the crew. Okay. So there's myself. There's Frank Sylvester. Uh, five College World Series from Philadelphia. Taught me how to umpire in, the, in a Pendel semi-pro league, which was – out of sight in the early 90s for summer league. I mean, you had hundreds of people at games and things like that. Hundreds of people at things like that, those games. Um, John McArdle, one of my dear friends. Was he the guy uh, from the – Chris, uh, let me interrupt. Was he at the Carpenter Cup? He was the director, he is. right? Because he, he was down there talking to us, I remember. He is. He is. And um, I would give the, another slot to Gene Otto. He's like a father to me. He is the commissioner of the Philadelphia Umpires Association. But he was the one who stuck by me when I was younger. And, he, sorry, he was the one who said to John McArdle, this kid can umpire. I want you to fix him. And that was 1994. And I worked a whole season with John in American Legion. And that's how John became one of my, one of my best friends. And um, he put me in touch with so many other people in baseball. And John also did a College World Series as an umpire, a crew chief in, in so many conference tournaments down here, Atlantic 10, Big East. So he knows his way around a baseball field. Uh, as far as Gene is concerned, 
Uh, Gene um, was always in my corner. Um, we maintain a great, great relationship, and I'll do anything for him. And uh, we just work very well together. We fill slots for Carpenter Cup for John. Uh, if I do favors for Gene, if I can, I will, because he now signs the Pendel League. And uh, I even joined the PIAA for him this year so I could be a part of his staff for high school. It would be short, but unfortunately that, uh, that didn't work out. Now, as far as positions are concerned, uh, John, uh, since he would block a lot of the sun, I'd put him at first base. Uh, Frankie's at second because he's in better shape than all of us, and he's in his 60s. Uh, Gene is at third, and guess who's on the plate, Chris? Who's on the stick? Like yeah. Well, if we expand the crew to six umpires, can we give Rich left field? <laughs> Rich could be left out. <laughs> no, I, I want to be on the left field foul line. Oh, you'd be a, you would be a ball girl? You'd be a ball girl. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, I want to be on, in the World Series. I want to be on the left field. Oh, okay. Rich, can you give him question three? This is your, your main man here. Okay. Uh, oh, boy. This question is coming from a guy who shoots us questions every week, and he only identifies himself as Bill from, quote, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. It's almost like forget about it. Yeah, forget about it. He's asked right. us the question every week. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. What's uh, your question? Chris, uh, you are someone who has known John for a long time. Can you speak to some of the criticism he receives and also some of the praise? And he's looking for an unbiased opinion, but he doubts that he'll get it. <laughs> and that's Bill I, from Don't Worry About It. Bill from Don't Worry About It. The praise from John, uh, one of the things that impressed me the most about him was I actually watched him handle a coach. I forget what, what game we were in. It's probably one of those men's leagues, John. And um, I like the way that you assert how this is going to go in a bad direction real quick. I, I like those words. I actually used those words. That was perfect game. Okay. I knew we were somewhere together. We've been in a lot of places together. Yeah, that's um, So I, I, I still use those words. I thought that was very impressive. Uh, now, granted, they know who you are, so they're going to give you a little bit of rope. But be that as it may, I felt that that was very impressive. Um, the way you handle the way you handle personnel, let's put it that way. The way you handle personnel is, I think, a, a very, very strong uh, plus in your corner. It's definitely something that you uh, have worked hard at. Uh, your criticisms, I mean, I talked about them. Um, you're, you're Chris Losey 30 years ago. So good luck with that. Yeah, the criticism, yeah, that speaks to it. The criticism, I, I assume they're talking about from this podcast, is usually like that I'm an arrogant, egotistical uh, dictator right. who rules like. Uh, All correct. Yeah. That's, Bill, it's not you're that right, Bill. far off. It's not that He's, far off. But you know what, Bill? I was the same way. And. Uh, Right now, John has the power. You want the power? <laughs> Take it from him. That's a quote. We're going to cut that up and use that. Okay. All right. Danny from Philadelphia, PA. So I don't know if this guy has some uh, personal experience with you or not. But hi, Chris. You have a reputation in some circles of inserting yourself and making games about you. Do you think these criticisms are warranted? Thanks for taking this question. <laughs> Uh, Danny, uh, I really don't think it's a question of inserting myself. Here's the problem. And I found out, um, I heard this quote last summer from a dear friend of mine, Tony Gisandi, who was a, another high level division one college umpire. We did a couple college summer leagues together last year. And, um, he said something about, uh, about attitude. So I'm going to give you this, Danny, and you tell me if you think this is true. All right. Oh, Chris, you have an attitude. And I come out and I tell you, no, coach, basically, my attitude is based on your attitude. <laughs> so let that sink in. If you show me respect, then I have nothing but to show you respect. So, Danny, I'm going to ask you, did you play softball in South Philly or not? But, I mean, no, you're right. I mean, I had a tendency to, to, to you know, but let's face it. I'm going to tell you why. I don't care who anybody is. When you're young and you're an umpire and you want to do the right thing, you have that level of insecurity about you. 
And that level of insecurity leads to, well, I have to show that I'm in control. So yes, you could be inserting yourself in something where you shouldn't. You learn from those though. The second thing is, is also, is that um, you want to know you got things right. You'll, 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 you may insert yourself into something and then the next half inning, you'll ask the first base coach, hey, I got that right, Rich, didn't I? All bad, all bad. And those are things that I've learned. So, Danny, you're right. Thank you for the question, but that hasn't happened in quite some time. We lost your uh, – oh, there you go. Uh, we, by the time we go on air to start recording, we still have questions that come in. So two more came in from the time we wrote up this thing. To go ahead. Now. Uh, go ahead. We always hear you guys talk about John, his umpiring, and his assigning. What about Rich Glazer? How is he on the field? <laughs> that is Jason from Vincenttown, New Jersey. Jason, there's a Benny Hill skit where there are these blind guys with a cane playing soccer. <laughs> and these young guys are going around the blind guys with the crowd going crazy. Well, picture one of those guys with a cane standing on the first baseline, and that's Rich. Now, Rich, to, to me, I love the fact that he is dedicated to the group. Um, he's transitioned away from on the field stuff and more in an executive role. Uh, I think he's John's glue in some cases. Uh, he runs the meetings well, when, you know, the, the, the annual meetings. And why, why would you uh, zero in on a guy that uh, is probably old enough to be your father? That's not a good thing to do. Yeah. Well, as you know, as the assigner, I mean, I would just say Rich's best attribute on the field is his true passion for umpiring. I, we gave him an award right. a couple of years ago. Just loves being out there, and that's palpable, you know, for anybody. If the, everybody right. there knows if you want to be there or not, and Rich clearly wants to be there, I think yep. that works tremendously to his benefit. Yep. So, I wasn't expecting the question, but that's the best uh, endorsement I can give you, Rich. Well, I. You know, I I appreciate that, and um, sure. you know, you know me. I think I'm the oldest guy in the group, by far. And uh, by I very love, far. Yeah, I mean, I I love being there. I look forward to, um, particularly my 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 passion, as John would know, is working the men's games, for the South Jersey Men's Baseball League, and also uh, for the John D. Benedictus League. I love doing those games on Saturdays and Sundays, yeah. and uh, I mean, I. I just love it. I, I mean, uh, you may know I played um, big time baseball and softball for a long time, and I'm having more fun working as an umpire than I ever did in my baseball and softball career. That's good to hear. Outstanding. Nice. Last question for you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, Dan from Marlton, New Jersey. How would you describe the overall philosophy of the TSEUA? Um, I think. Um, if you're I going to make it in this group. If I can interpret this, I think, I mean, it seems like as a member, what is the overall experience yeah. like? Yeah, and I'm with you on that. I think if you're going to make it in the TSE, you're going to have to work very, very hard. Nobody's going to give it to you. I think that uh, there's a lot of training that's afforded to you. And as much as I like to say that there's a shortage, there are some guys that are willing to leapfrog over you. And again, there's that cutthroat stuff. So don't give anybody ammunition to, to shoot you, but also at the same time, uh, be prepared to work, especially in the TSC. If, you're, if that's your first umpire organization that you're a part of, then, you know, you have to show on the field what you can do. Chris, I always uh, appreciate your perspective on things in the umpiring world and to uh, give your un opinion unfiltered. Um, so thank you. Th thanks for everything you've taught me. Thanks for everything you do for the group. And thanks for coming on here. Maybe we can do it again. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. See you.